Good evening. This is Strange Love, and I'm your host, Cami Chaos. Welcome, babies. Good evening, and welcome to Strange Love Live Tech Edition. I'm your host, Cami Chaos, and as always, I'm joined by Dr. Normal. Hello. Thank you for turning my microphone on at the right time this time. You're welcome. That was my bad, not yours. Yeah, there's other bads, but that's okay. This evening, we're joined by Jason Grigsby. Hello, everyone. And I apologize, I actually distracted you right before the camera <laughs> turned on. And I didn't put his mic <laughs> and then, on right and then, away. Yeah, or... and then Dr. Normal didn't turn your mic on. <laughs> So uh, this is Jason Grigsby. Hello, everyone, again. And I should apologize again for messing up and uh, distracting Cammy just as the camera turned on. Yeah, he asked me a very important question. (laughs) He asked me if I had my cheat sheet. I have little crib notes hidden over there, and I needed to have them because I'm going to ask an incredibly intelligent question. I don't know. know. But I am going... Oh, before we begin... Um, I just wanted to thank you guys and also congratulate you. I'm so excited about the uh, public broadcasting um, uh, Strange Love Live. That is very, very cool. And the studio looks awesome. So um, I'm I'm really, really excited and sort of strangely proud, which <laughs> I have no right to be. But, you know, it's really neat to see the show taking off in this way. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And you can because it's you're part of the whole Portland community. And there's no way we could have pulled this off without, you know, all of the support of so many people in the Portland community, not just people who've been on the show, but people right. who've helped with the show and watched the show and hung out and laughed and, right. and yelled at the trolls and... And it, oh, or been a troll. Or, well, <laughs> <it's not> trolls. <laughs> uh, trolls. We're working on the troll problem. I don't like to talk about the trolls during tech edition. Let's talk about the trolls during after hours. All right, excellent. But first, we're going to talk about um, mobile developments. Yes. And there's one thing that I want you to explain before we get started. Okay. And, and it was a statement that you sent me an email. When to choose native application development versus mobile web or hybrid applications. Um, ex- explain what a native appli- application is versus a mobile web application or a hybrid application. So um, when people are choosing to build applications for um, like iPhones or Blackberries or Google Android or whatever the case I think may I be. Just may have had a shining light of comprehension, but please continue. Yeah. So they they have to um, they have to choose what language, what what sort of frameworks they're going to build it in. Native applications are built using whatever the programming languages of that platform. So for iPhones, it's Objective C. For Blackberries, it's Java. You know, etc. Mm-hmm. And um, so in doing so, you get some real good advantages. Um, but you also, you know, the language isn't the same across those platforms. So if you want to take your application from platform to platform, you have to rebuild it. Mobile web is, you know, the same web technology that we're accustomed to from desktop web browsing, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, designed and formatted for mobile devices. Um, and then hybrid apps are sort of a mix of both. Um, so, so, so when... Do you choose those? When is the appropriate time yeah. for each of those so options? So this is, uh, and this is something that um, that I, I've been doing a lot of speaking and, and talking to people about because we, as a company, um, had to make a decision about what we wanted to be. And we're talking um, about Cloud Four. Cloud Four, yeah. yeah. Um, we we helped um, with the creation of the Obama iPhone application, mm-hmm. and after that, for about a two and a half week period. Um, every single day people were asking me, um, or asking us, I guess generally, like if we would go build iPhone apps for them. And we had originally started Cloud4 to focus on um, mobile, and in particular mobile web, um, believing that that was where development was going to go, but we were getting really strongly pulled towards doing native development for iPhone. Um, and we spent a lot of November and December trying to make a decision about what we wanted to do and ultimately decided that we didn't want to do native iPhone app development. We wanted to actually be able to build stuff that worked cross-platform and would wait for the mobile web to catch up. And so um, when I've been going and talking, particularly talking to web developers, I've been talking about, okay, what does the landscape look like? Why is it that everybody's really excited about the App Store? And um, how can you get applications into the App Store now using web technology? And how long will that be a 
distinguishing characteristic of native applications versus doing mobile web or doing um, uh, hybrid applications. So, so I come at this from two perspectives. One, being an iPhone user, I'm mm-hmm. really used to the App Store, and it is an easy way for me to just go, okay, I want to grab this, I want to grab this. But how do other people get those applications on there? If they're not an iPhone user, they're not using the App Store, obviously. Right. And the second part of that is what are the difficulties it brings using the App Store? Because I would assume it. otherwise you have more of an open source atmosphere. You can get things in a different way. And I know the, the App Store, we've had at least one guest on our show that had submitted something to the App Store that was um, something that we had used and was a good solid product that was rejected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, depending on the platform, I mean, um, it, you, in some, on some platforms, you still have to go through like a carrier in order to download applications. Other platforms, you can just go to the web and find an application and go download it just like you might download an application for your computer. So, it, it varies a bit. Um, every single platform, um, the carriers and the you know the siblings of the carriers all want to have their own app stores, um, uh, so you're going to see a lot more of that because Apple's been so successful. So so they're trying to do that. Um, but I think that that one of the things that you're starting to see is Apple's now at um, is it 65,000 applications or 85,000 applications wow. in the app store or something like that. Um, it's it's no longer easy, you know, the question you asked was, how do you, how do people find applications outside of the App Store if you don't have it? And I think another question is, when you get to that level, that many applications, and that's only a year into it, how are you going to find things on the App Store itself? I mean, findability is an issue no matter which, which mechanism is being used to deliver the applications. Because I don't... I only I search for applications. If I know what I'm looking for, I'll search for it. Right. But I would never sit and browse the App Store because it's just too big. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I mean Apple's um, Apple's not a search engine company, mm-hmm. um, and the fact that the App Store um, not so much from a like delivery mechanism, um, and there there are issues with that as well. But um, from a just a a search engine perspective, you're not able to use the same tools that um, that Google uses to figure out what web pages are relevant. So it's um, it's it's actually difficult to find things like in a broad category if you don't know exactly what you're looking for. Um, the most recent example for me is uh, we've got a two and a half year old daughter, and I was looking for a way to distract her one night when she was a little tired and not um, being very cooperative mm-hmm. at a restaurant. So um, I like, she really likes sort of flashcard like iPhone apps, um, things that are educational. So I went into the educational um, section to look for applications and basically I had to weed through SAT prep um, applications and you know college study applications and high school study applications um, and you know a whole bunch of, of applications that were for for um, grade school kids mm-hmm. you know but there was no way to say okay I'm looking for applications that are really targeted from you know like two to four yeah or something like that and you don't you, and there are a lot of um, a lot of similar ways in which your ability to find applications on the app store is is challenging so. Um, I, I think um, what, what we what we basically came to the conclusion of, and, and one of the things that we're waiting for is um, the differentiating factors between why somebody wants to do a native application versus um, building something that's that's using web technology. Um, the differences are less than people realize, mm-hmm. and they're going away. Um, so you know, we're just sort of waiting for that to to happen. Do you think it's because it's kind of a trend right now? Everyone's so excited uh, in the United States, for the most at least. Everyone's so excited about the iPhone, and every time the the craze for the iPhone starts to die down a little bit, and it's genius marketing, really. Yeah. They release something even more fantastic about the iPhone that gets someone else pulled in. I, I think the yeah, there's a lot of hype in the United States, and some of it's justified, and it's it's hard to complain because. In early 2008, a lot of the speaking that I was doing was trying to convince people that, you know, like, yes, mobile's going to be big. You know, you can't have something that's, um, you know, 3.3 billion or 4 billion phones on the planet and, 
you know, twice the number of televisions and not have it, not suddenly realize, oh my gosh, that's going to be huge. Um, but I was doing a lot of that, and I no longer have to do that. I mean, mm-hmm. people pretty much in the United States have suddenly re- woken up to what the rest of the world has been doing for quite some time. Um, but I also think that the U.S. perspective on iPhone success is a little skewed um, because, uh, you know, the iPhone's not even the best-selling smartphone in the United States, um, but we act like it is. Um, and Nokia, you know, ev- everybody was really amazed at how Apple sold, you know, one one million iPhones in, in the first day or first weekend. I don't remember exactly what it was, but Nokia sells one million phones every single day. Yeah. I mean, the the European perspective or the Asian perspective, um, Americans were really happy the iPhone um, camera got to three megapixels, and in Asia it's at 12 so Dr. Normal's just laughing over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're behind the times, even with yeah, our yeah. advanced fancy technology of the well, iPhone. I think I think the iPhone is ahead when it comes from a user experience perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not that's not the only facet to a phone, and it's ahead in the App Store. Um, and I, I love my iPhone. Like, don't get me wrong. Um, so I, you know, I just also think that. The degree to which um, people have bought into the App Store hype and have become irrational about what they're like, you know, I'm going to, we're going to go build an application. We don't have content in this area. We don't have experience in this area. I can't program, but we're still going to go, you know, build an application, pay somebody to build it, sell it at 99 cents, and somehow make my money back. I mean, it just doesn't. It just doesn't work out. It's the new advertising on your blog, where you get the little tiny advertisement at the bottom of your blog, and you think that that will somehow like make you a billionaire. Yeah. yeah. Is that the new? I'm going to make all this money off yeah. of my app store. Well, I mean, it's it's the same sort of. A, um, uh, there's so many parallels in what's happening in mobile right now to what was happening in um, the early days of the internet, mm-hmm. where the same sort of uh, like when I was. Um, uh, when I when it was the early days of the web, I was at a Barnes and Noble and I was just looking at web books. That was all I was doing, and I got stopped by somebody to ask, you know, like if I knew about building websites, <laughs> if I build websites, how to build a website for their business, that sort of stuff. Um, so just because you were looking at them, just because I was looking at the books, and apparently I looked like a geek at it. I don't know. I think it was because of the books. Yeah, <laughs> and and. Were you, what were you doing? I mean, were you at that point into that? Did yeah, you have that yeah, knowledge? Yeah, yeah. So the person had you pegged right, but... Yeah, yeah. but still, I mean, stopping a complete stranger in, yeah. in Barnes & Noble to ask them how well, to that, build your website... That makes you a creepy person, it, regardless. Yeah, yeah. It, was a little, it was a little creepy. <laughs> That's a little unsettling. Yeah. So it, it's it, is the parallel that there are people who are working on it that get it and that they're the hardcore users and everybody else is kind of behind the times. Because I remember when people were just starting to kind of get a comfort zone with the internet. It went from, like, you only use the internet if you were a geek and you knew what you were doing and you had to know command codes and et cetera and so on and so forth. And then slowly it became... uh, uh, had a better user interface and people became more comfortable with it and, and began to embrace and understand you know, it. It's it's strange because um I don't know why the United States like I don't I don't think you can pin it on any one particular reason why the United States ended up behind other countries in terms of its perspective on mobile mm-hmm. um and actual mobile technology. Um but the countries that are um, that are really advanced in mobile technology have more in common with developing countries than they do with the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, in that, the number of people who you know who access the internet via mobile devices in you know Japan and um, you know South Korea and countries like that um, vastly outnumber the number that access it you know via desktop machines. And that's also true in developing countries. Um, the amount of activity that happens via mobile devices and the amount that it's used for currency and for, um, you know, just the sort of day-to-day business transactions in in those highly developed mobile countries and then also in, you know, Nigeria um, is 
is really similar. Mm -hmm. I mean, at different levels, different levels of sophistication, completely different technologies um, as far as like the advancement of the actual handsets themselves, but much more similar than what's happened in the United States where, um, you know, we are sort of now just waking up to SMS and to MMS and, you know, what's possible with data services to a mobile device. What's MMS? Um, see? Uh, so MMS is the feature that's going to come to your phone whenever AT&T gets their act together. Mm-hmm. Um, Multimedia? Yes, exactly. Okay. Text I, messaging. I missed that. I used to have that on my old phone. Yes. So being really able to take that. pictures and send pictures, video, um, songs, that sort of stuff okay. via text message. Or actually, um, in in a lot of countries in the world, um, uh, you use SMS or MMS as a way to um, to pay for things. Mm-hmm. Um, so actually, I guess that's maybe just SMS. But basically, you know, like if you want to buy um, a ringtone, um, and a special SMS comes in and says, you know, do you accept this SMS for two ninety nine? And if you say yes, it goes on your phone bill, and you get to download the the song. So now we step away from the iPhone here, and we forget that the iPhone exists for a moment. My old phone, Doctor Normal. Any, what was my old phone? Do you remember? The Motorola? Um, the uh, last razor? one. Was it a razor? Yeah, it was a probably razor. a razor. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I could do all the MMS happiness and the joy and the picture right. and sending the right. files. The and iPhone just doesn't do it on an at and And right. so all of a sudden. You can do it on a Nokia. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't even, it didn't really think about it because I didn't send a lot of pictures and yeah. stuff. But I believe it was MediaCheck one day sent me a picture. And I don't even remember. I had to get on my computer yes, yeah. to go find out yeah, what it yeah. was. And I was like, by the time I got there, I was just so pissed off. It had nothing. She, I'm not, yeah. I wasn't mad at you, media chick. You're a lovely <laughs> woman. I was mad at my phone because I hadn't realized that all of a sudden that feature was just like ripped from my fingertips. And I was like, you, I, you suck. Yeah, yeah. But then, uh, you know, it made up for it for all, in all sorts of other beautiful ways. But yeah. Yeah. Um, so why do you think we, I, I went on a tangent? I apologize. Why well, do you think I was we just got- going to say that you know with the iPhone, um, why do you you know who needs multimedia messaging? I mean, I've got Twitter, I've got the web, uh, you know, I've got an email. You know, I know that you're not going to believe this, Doctor Arnold, but not everyone is on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> what? Then then why? Occasionally, do they have I meet someone that's not, and I stare at them. Yeah. And I go, really? Yeah. Why aren't you on Twitter? And they're like, oh, it seems stupid. I don't understand it. They're you know, I, um, it's it's hard to really, I, I think in the same way that, that explaining the value proposition for somebody for um, Twitter mm-hmm. is difficult to do. I think the same thing is, is true of SMS. Like, at, at, you know, the people who do the calculations on how much a, a, a per, um, amount of uh, per byte of data that goes over an SMS message and like how much you're paying and it's insane and everybody um, or a lot of people assume that at some point you'll like people will move over to um, to instant messaging or some sort of replacement where they don't have the incremental costs but I mean it was a hundred billion dollar industry in 2007 SMS alone, which is more than Hollywood box office receipts, DVD sales and rentals, video game revenue, and... More than box office, really? Because those theaters ream you. Box office? <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, um, music industry revenue all combined. Wow. So... So, you know, like, I, you know, why do you need the pictures via um, SMS? I don't know, but I can tell you that a lot of the world enjoys it. And, you know, the same questions were being asked about SMS, like, three years ago, four years ago in the United States, while the rest of the world was really all over it. And um, now we're, you know, texting all over the place. We're texting fiends. Uh, right before the show started, I sat here in my chair texting with uh, our lone studio audience member, Trying to figure out when she was going to get here. Right. And telling her she needed to text us when she got here because otherwise we're never going to let her in. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So text it. Does it, is it SMS on the iPhone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just not MMS. Yeah. Is well, there... MMS is in the software, but AT&T hasn't released it for general use yet. So when the new so release the phone of the OS. So the could do it. As of 
June, whatever, whenever the 3GS came out. Okay. Yeah. All right. You know, I was going to say that part of the problem is uh, around uh, the rest of the world, MMS and services like that are cheaper than in the U.S. So well, that's why I would used. assume that it was more widely used in developing yeah. countries is because exactly. it's more accessible monetarily. Yeah. Yeah. So, or even in Europe or other places, I don't think they get, you know, gouged per message like the, the yeah. U.S. carriers do. The other, the other thing that goes on in developing countries is that, um, that most of the people are using prepaid phone cards mm-hmm. and, um, it's right now. It's a little bit harder to do um, data services over prepaid versus um, like SMS or MMS, where you can get, you know, like those are much easier. And in those countries, the the price for minutes of voice are actually much higher, and so people use um, SMS or MMS as, as a supplement for voice to avoid those charges, voice charges. Okay, so I'm gonna. Shift slightly, still on mobile. Something else that you said in your email, um, and and I, I think I remember seeing something about this on the cloud four. So a website it was a censorship and the moral imperative um, with mobile use and mobile web. Yeah. So um, one of, one of the things that that I I realized recently, and I, I only realized it as I started seeing a lot of the applications for the iPhone get. Um, rejected and rejected for somewhat dubious reasons, and um, people were having a lot of trouble figuring out. Okay, well, what, what's Apple going to do? What what are they not going to do? And um, what I realized is that while I'm not particularly passionate about open source, like I like open source software, I use open source software all the time. I was a journalism major, and so censorship is something that I I cannot stand, cannot mm-hmm. abide. And um, and as I was preparing for um, the presentation that I gave at Web Visions and sort of going through my slides again, I was looking at this quote um, that uh, Steve Jobs had written in an email. This guy had developed this application, and this application was a countdown. Um, it was basically a countdown to when Bush was out of office. And it was this little cartoony Bush, and he had his he had a hand, and he was you know like it was just like counting down the number of hours and days until until Bush was out of office. And you know it was it was a stupid app, no more stupid than say like the fart apps that are on the iPhone. But he submitted it, it and it got stinks. it got rejected. <laughs> and um, he he sent an email to Steve Jobs, um, and Steve decided to respond. And Steve said, um, "Your application is going to piss off half of our customer base. Why bother?" Yeah. And and the thing was is that the application wasn't it wasn't I mean it was cartoonish but it wasn't it wasn't clowning it wasn't insulting it wasn't it wasn't any of those things and at that moment in time we're talking about a president that has the lowest approval rating since Nixon mm-hmm. so if Apple is unwilling to to let parity into the App Store of somebody who has a you know what was it 23 percent approval rating or something like that at that point it was it was really really low if they're unwilling to do that then how likely are they to allow in applications that um say at a point where the approval rating is really high so say during the middle of the iraq war would they have let in an application that was providing data about say casualties that were going on in iraq when approval rating in the united states was up in the 80s and 90s and if anyone um, early stages of the Iraq War, um, since it's still going on. But anyone who who criticized the president was considered and attacked as being mm-hmm. non-patriotic. Um, and the point that really sort of solidified this for me was um, the Electronic Freedom Foundation. Somebody decided to create an application for the iPhone that would allow the Electronic Freedom App, uh, Freedom Foundation, or foundation right um to have uh basically people have an app that would update them on stuff that was going on pull in their blog posts and things like that and one of the blog posts um had a video of it's it's a pretty common thing i don't remember the movie it's about um 
about uh, Nazis and Germany, Hitler, and people will rewrite the um, the captions underneath the subtitles. Oh, that's really popular. Dr. Normal might know. It's going, I see it all the time, the... The, they rewrite the Hitler tantrum scene? Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm contemplating uh, one on the Ch- Strange of Life chat room uh, as the subject matter uh, for the next episode, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, continue. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so, so they um, they rejected that that application because in the video he uh, he cursed mm-hmm. like one of the subtitles was fuck and so he decided not to do that and um, or Apple rejected it and so the Electronic Freedom Foundation right gets rejected by Apple um, and so so from my perspective. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who look at what's going on in mobile right now and say, you know, the iPhone is really the only game in town. And one, I think that that's that's a really like narrow view yeah. and not a worldwide view. I love my iPhone, and secondly, but it's not the case. Yeah. And secondly, if it actually were, that would be a very, very bad thing because um, we need to make sure that mobile technology, mobile web technology is available so that we don't have, you know, arbitrary gatekeepers keeping information out. I mean, um, so that was, that's that's what I mean by making sure that actually the mobile web is a viable alternative mm-hmm. to native application development because, um, you know, when you go beyond, you know, fart apps and you actually want to do something that might be something that that is bringing um, change into a country or bringing... Might make a difference in yeah, kind. Then all of a sudden you're running into situations where you really need to make sure that that you you can publish that and mm-hmm. publish it freely. Um, and so, you know, and I think if you look at organizations like there's a organization mobileactive.org, mm-hmm. which does a lot of work with, um, uh, with um, mobile activity for... Um, uh, using mobile in countries to affect change or to to deal with um, crisis or emergencies or you know those sorts of things um, that that organization is um, they're advocating for open source software mobile web software things that will allow it to be used across a variety of platforms and using it in that way as a way to affect change in the world and I think that if, if it's actually narrowed to just one platform you can't you don't get that so get the monopoly and yeah and so so down. that is that is the reason why i think that there is a there's an absolute moral imperative to make sure that mobile web remains a viable option and continues to be a viable option outside of any particular um whether it's iphone or blackberry or whatever the case may be we are bumping up against the end of the tech edition but before you go i want you to tell us um about mobile portland yes. and where we can find you on the internet so um, so there's a local group, uh, Mobile Portland, um, based off of um, Mobile Mondays, which is an international thing for um, people to get together and talk about mobile. And it meets every fourth Monday at um, About Us, their gracious hosts. Hello, um, About Us. Happy yes, birthday. Exactly. Um, and uh, this month we've got Moblin. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a, it's actually for um, mobile internet devices and netbooks. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people from Intel are going to be coming out to talk about it, so that's really exciting. And next month is PhoneGap, um, which is one of the frameworks for building hybrid applications. Um, And that's all at mobileportland.com. And our site is cloud4.com, and I'm on Twitter as Greg, so people can find me there. All right, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Everybody stay tuned. We'll be back with After Hours in a few minutes. Thanks.